My great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Amal Tricher Kabesh, a longtime friend and a great academic. I think we're really, uh, we're really happy to have, to have her with us here today. She's going to be talking about the necessity of belonging. It's uh, about a 50 minute talk, hmm. thereabouts. We'll and see how we do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she, she'll, um, she'll tell you more about how she's going to organize her, her talk herself. So it's a really great pleasure. Um, Professor Amal Tricher Kabesh teaches at the University of Nottingham in the School of Sociology and uh, Social Policy. Um, her research is uh, mainly uh, devoted at the moment to the relationship between Egypt and the UK, but she also works on citizenship, gender and subjectivity. Um, her two main books, I would say, no? Uh, the books she has authored are not those she has edited, because there are quite a few of those. But the books she has authored are Postcolonial Masculinities, Emotions, Histories and Ethics. And her book, which was recently published in the UK, uh, is uh, Egyptian Revolutions, Conflict, Repetition, and Identification. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. I am, I have to say, really impressed that you're all here at nine o'clock. I have to say, I hate being filmed. I hate the thought of a microphone. And I only agreed because I'm so fond of Adrian, actually. Otherwise, anybody else, I would have said no. So... Now, belonging, so what we're going to try and think through this morning and open up and explore is the question of belonging, about which we all have feelings. I don't think I'm the only person in this room who has feelings and experiences, both about belonging and not belonging, feeling out of place. And so what I would do, actually, is invite you to ask me com questions or make comments or whatever as I go along. One of the things I discovered yesterday is one of the reasons that I've been invited, please don't all go rushing out of the room as I say this, is to try to introduce you a bit more to psychoanalysis. So this, I suspect, is a whole theoretical framework which some of you may know something about, some of you may know a lot about, and some of you may know nothing about. So when I get to that bit, or any bit, and you really don't know what I'm saying, then please do stop me. I'm happy to do interactive lectures. That's what I'm used to. Okay, so, okay, let's just try and go. And in fact, what I want to try and open up with is the question about how you cannot think about belonging without also thinking about identity. So actually belonging and identity go very, very closely together. They're very intertwined. Indeed, they are in the very word. To belong, if you break it down, means to belong somewhere, to be in place, to know, who, to know where you are, but also actually is the word to be. So to be, if you like, is an indication about issues and matters of identity. So what I want to try and do this morning, I've never done this before, so you're going to have to bear with me actually, is to try and think through much more closely belonging and identity. Because we cannot imagine or indeed narrate, narration is quite a theme in this lecture this morning, but we cannot think about Actually, we cannot imagine who we are without also thinking about where we have come from, where we are in the present, and where we're going to. So there's the question then, actually, of time, of temporality, and I'll say more about that as I go along. So I'm here in Malta. I arrived yesterday, um, and actually I had an experience this morning of feeling really like a stranger. Right, and actually, Adrian gave me, couldn't have given me clear instructions about how to get here on the number 31 bus. And then halfway through yesterday evening, I thought, never trust a local, right? Because locals always know exactly where they are, right? Yeah, I don't mean by that, this is nothing about Adrian as a human being, but actually, at that moment, he's a local. So he says to me, 
well, you just walk along like we've come along and you'll come to the bus terminal, it's not a problem, and then you catch the 31 and then you follow the students, right? So completely crystal clear, right, to your beloved professor, completely unclear to me, right? And it's unclear to me because I'm a stranger. I've, I've been to Malta once before, I'll tell you more about that in a moment, but actually, you know, I really don't quite know where I am. So with the, actually the words of a very good friend of mine, which goes, never trust a local, I decided to catch a taxi, which was a huge relief. So now, the last time I was in Malta, I've only been to Malta once before, was uh, a very short visit. And actually it was at the time, and this is crit crit critical in terms of this talk, when Malta was about to join the European Union. Right, so it was what, 14, my sense of time's horrible now, 2000, so about 14 years ago. So now there you are, actually, in a very different place. You've now got the presidency of the EU, you've joined, but actually that does mean a shift. Actually, it means a shift for you as Maltese people and in terms of Malta, in terms of its geopolitical location, yeah? Or am I, have I imagined this? It must have meant something. You know, most of you probably were too young, so I'm going to look at the two el more elderly people in the room that I am, sorry about this, Kevin, but, you know, <laughs> actually, um, you know, so actually it must have mean something. It must mean something that you go from being outside of the European Union to becoming members of the European Union. The, the conference that I was invited to speak at actually was really about actually asking people in NGOs and so on and so forth to think through what does this mean for Malta. And I think for me, it isn't just about what does it mean in terms of the geographical and the political, it also means in terms of the social and the cultural. After all, next year, Valencia is the European cap cultural capital of year for 2018. So it has opened up different possibilities for you. So on and so forth. So anyway, so I haven't, to be honest, really thought about Malta much, except I have, you have a warm place in my being, which I'll talk about more in a moment. But actually it is then, you know, and my, on my journey here, I try and remember where I stayed. Of course, I couldn't remember. But what I do remember is the conference. I remember the people, can't remember their names, but I remember the sense of being there. So when we think about belonging, right, so I want to draw out, we narrate our belonging, as I've just begun to do that now through my kind of short anecdotes. But belonging has also got the question of time in it, which I've also mentioned, but it's also got the sense of sense. So when I say I don't remember the people's names, but I do remember the sense of being there. I remember the food. I remember the, 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 you know, my hotel room, for example. I remember the view across the bay. I was staying in St. Julian's. It was just, you know, and I remember the sunlight and I remember the light. I remember, the, so my senses kick into operation. And right now I would like my senses, can somebody open a window for me? Because am I the only person that's hot in here? Thank you. So belonging, right, which might seem actually as if somehow or other, you know, kind of quite a simple notion, entails what I'm trying to pull out this morning, an interweaved web, an interweaved web of place, of the senses, of time. And these would, and what do I mean by them being interweaved? So. I'm sure I'm not the only person who's had this experience. So you're walking down the road, so you've got that your sense of your body in motion, as it were, right? In the sense of, you know, the air on your skin. And then, and that's kind of fairly normal. And then perhaps you catch a smell. You know, actually last night as I walked around, you know, I walked past a pizzeria and, you know, and then actually, you know, so that then, you know, that's what I mean by the issue of time. Then you're thrown back to other places. Actually, I was thrown back to Italy and so on and so forth, right? So actually, you know, belonging is also crucially about memory. So when I talk about, the, so it's interweaved. Belonging is always interweaved. It's always complex. 
it's always about more than one thing going on at the same time. So we're then transported, like if we take, you know, my short walk yesterday, you know, and so then we're transported back to another place, another time, and another memory. And there, actually, also people. It's often, you know, it's, it's, we never do this in isolation because actually when I was sort of thinking, you know, actually, can I manage, can I do the bus? Well, of course I can do the bus, but actually, you know, will I have enough time and so on and so forth, actually. And a friend of mine came in and so we also kind of into my head, as it were. So then we draw upon people at those moments, actually, as another resource. So what I'm trying to open up with you are two interlinked issues, right? How each of these aspects of belonging, time, place, sense, memory, narration, are actually in themselves complex and in themselves a crucial aspect of our psychosocial being. I'll talk more about what do I mean by psychosocial being in a moment. And in turn, these various aspects actually come together or actually pull us apart in complex ways. So, I want to slightly... Am I making sense? Am I, are you following me? Yeah, because, because I've, I've not taught you before, so I haven't got a sense of you as a group. But so I'm doing okay. Pace okay? Can you all hear me? Yeah? Okay, let's keep going. So, right, so actually, you know, belonging, right, actually I'm trying to also say is both a personal matter and a social matter and, of course, absolutely draws upon you being a member of a nation. So right now, as much as you hold the presidency of the EU and you're firmly members of the EU, I have to say I hope you remain that way, for some of us in the UK who, you know, are very preoccupied, who wanted to stay, I'll come straight out, I voted to remain, I think it's insane that we leave, but there we go. But some of us are, of course, preoccupied with what does it mean? What does it mean to leave the European Union? So, you know, so there I am in Maltese Airport yesterday and I get out my passport and I can join the EU line, you know, and I'm in and out and it doesn't take too long. But then, of course, there's that question then about, well, would I need a visa? Let's say the next time I come, would I need a visa? When have I got to change my passport? Right, and actually questions of visas and passports are absolutely national signifiers, national signs of belonging. But of course, so while you're firmly embedded, we are firmly on the way out. And these things have different meanings, and they have different meanings from the personal to the social to the national. So what I want to try and do is to take much more securely on the question of identity. So one of the things, because I absolutely draw on a psychosocial studies framework, right, which I hope will become clearer to you, what do I mean by that? And I not only do I, so sorry, there's going to be a lot of the psycho in the next few paragraphs, so hang on in. Okay, so and actually my take on the psychosocial actually is I draw upon psychoanalysis. And I hope it will become clearer to you that I'm not just insane in terms of taking on psychoanalysis. Please don't contradict that, Adrian. But actually, I do have my rational, if not irrational, reasons for kind of, you know, thinking things through, through the psychosocial, particularly through psychoanalysis. Now, one of the first, actually, premises of my psychosocial studies framework is that we become human beings through our relationships with others. In other words, we become human, we gain our very subjectivity itself, our personhood, to use that kind of language, but I would drive it further and say subjectivity. We gain our subjectivity absolutely and crucially through our relationships with other human beings. So our first step in terms of becoming human subjects is actually through belonging itself. Now, 
most of us are born into a family. They may have worked, they may not have worked. Every family has its dysfunctional aspects. Believe me, every family does. But that is how, actually, we become human beings. So very crucially, our first encounter is through the relationship of belonging. And it's through belonging to other human beings, primarily our caretakers. They don't have to be our biological parents, but primarily the caretakers who uh, actually uh, cared for us if we were lucky, you know, nurtured us if we were fortunate. So in other words, there is no belonging without a relationship with other human beings. And initially, these other human beings is the family, is actually the most significant, actually, the family. But from that, you know, from infancy onwards, I tend to think of our lives and in terms of belonging and who matters in terms of circles. So if and I'm going to start outwards, working inwards. So, right, so, you know, if I think about actually, and I am in an odd way dependent as we all are on these people, whether they're from the outer or the in, inner. The dependency changes to say, you know, that I'm as dependent on the guy who cleans my office as I am on my husband is, of course, absurd, right? I mean, that's crazy. But we're still dependent on others. So, you know, so actually, you know, I am dependent on Keith, who does clean my office rather well. Actually, I'm lucky to have an office in that particular corridor, and like another corridor. We were all dependent, actually, on this room being set up, you know, for, for, for this talk. You know, you were dependent on me turning up. I was dependent on you turning up, right? So that's kind of one, if you like, outer circle. And then, of course, we're dependent on people who work in shops, if you like, people who service us, yeah, in one way or another. And actually, there, we would have to bring in class, actually, in terms of who services and who doesn't. So I don't necessarily know these people, the people who collect the rubbish, you know, uh, or indeed sweep the streets or whatever, but I'm still dependent on them. And then actually, you know, we then kind of go into, say, my neighbours, yeah? And, and when I mean my, my neighbours, actually partly in the UK, I also, by the way, have a home in Cairo. This might be quite crucial as to why I'm so preoccupied with belonging. I'll say more about that. Now, some of my neighbours, some are friends, you know, we stop and we talk, some are, you know, invite me in for a cup of coffee, other people we just nod to, but they're part of my map. If you like, they're part of my landscape, and in a way, they're also part of my sensecape itself. And then, of course, we get, you know, more intimate, you know, in terms of colleagues and acquaintances, into then the next circle, you know, actually, which is... The family, and again, they're members of the family. I might meet, in terms of my age now, kind of much more at funerals and stuff. But actually, you know, they're sort of still a part of my psychic map. They're some part of what kind of holds us all together. So the dependency, these circles, actually, I am arguing that we have a relationship, whether known or not known, familiar or not familiar, to these uh, to these people in what I think of as these different circles. And not everyone is equal, but it's absolutely dependent on context. Because, of course, I have no idea the name of the pilot who, who flew the plane from London to Malta yesterday. I have absolutely no idea who he is. I have absolutely no idea who kind of gave me my tea, so on and so forth. But at that moment, I'm more dependent on them, right, then say, actually, my friends, or indeed, uh, my, you know, to repeat, my husband, or, you know, or, my, my, or, you know, parents, right? So dependency and the relationship to and the relationship of being is also very context-driven. So while at some profound level, not everyone is equal, actually, this also, the dependency or the relationships change according to context itself. But I belong, actually, through other human be beings. I belong through them. I gain my identity. I gain the stuff of my being through my relationships with others. 
Now, I'm about to say something here which is very Egyptian. And we can talk about whether it's the same in Malta or not. And I have a suspicion it is. It's not quite the same in the UK. And what I want to say is I am because we are. Right? Now, so, and what do I mean by that? It's partly if we take psycho psych psychoanalysis as our starting point, all of us I are, I am because we are. But actually, at the risk of real caricature, in the Middle East, and correct me if I'm wrong, you guys speak so much Arabic, it's unbelievable, actually, even if you don't know it, actually. You know, so actually, so, you know, so when I come here, I kind of think, oh, God, thank God for that. I'm in a city. I don't know it at all, right? But actually, I can breathe. You know, I can walk down the street. The air feels familiar in a way that it never does in Europe, right? But in any case, you need to hang on to this phrase that I'm trying to introduce you to, which goes, I am because we are. So what I'm trying to say here is our sense of belonging, our subjectivity. We, uh, I need to ask you a question. Do they know the difference between subjectivity and identity? Um, those of them who have studied uh, um, social sciences might, but otherwise I don't think it's something we know. Okay, so let's, I'll just stay with the word identity. I think that might be better. So, so we get our identity through and within our relationships with other people. And that, of course, is in turn actually dependent on the context. And indeed, in turn, is dependent on the very cultural period that we inhabit, that we live in. So I'm sorry if I'm over-emphasizing the case of Europe, it is our preoccupation. Uh, but actually, it, you, you see, what I'm trying to say is that also identity and belonging shifts across different times. So in short, the shadow of the other, actually, this is really a, a phrase from Freud, actually, um, is actually where the shadow of the other is always at work within our very within the uh, within our very souls itself and so you know identity is also th through made through the shadow of the other similarly and this is where so that's one reason why i draw upon psychoanalysis but the other reason is it seems to me psychoanalysis or indeed psychosocial studies are the best framework to think through the, shred the shreddedness of lived experience. What on earth do I mean by the shreddedness of lived experience? By the way, it's not even a word in the English dictionary. So if you go run around and try and find it in, you know, grammar books or dictionaries or whatever, you're lost. But it seems to me that that word shreddedness actually most sums up. You see, I want a verb. It most sums up actually what it means to be human. Right? So, you know, society demands of us that we're coherent, that we present ourselves in a rational and coherent manner. But indeed, what we all know actually is the other stuff that makes up our lives, makes up our lived experience, right? And what is that? So, what makes up shreddedness? It's partly as much as other people bring joy and pleasure, they also bring irritation, they also bring disappointment, they also bring anger. Am I the only person in this room who feels these things about other people? Am I? Really? No. Thank you. Thank you for your honesty. Right? You see, so actually, it is about how to try and get at, actually, the jaggedness of being human, which actually is always underneath the demands on us to repeat the word, to be more coherent, to be more rational than we really are. So one of the social rules, actually, I think I am arguing, is one of the do's of the societies we inhabit is that we don't, uh, in a way, disclose um, actually how anxious we can get or how irritated we can get or how disappointed we are. In the Middle East, there are huge 
is it, it, huge, huge injunctions, for example, that you never criticize your parents, not the same in, the, in Europe, but huge injunctions. So it's then very difficult then to say, talk about how disappointed you can be in your mum or your dad or your brother or your sister or whoever it is. So psychoanalysis allows an entry into those bits where we feel we belong, and if you like, those bits where we feel we don't belong, right? Where we feel jagged and at an edge, actually alongside other people. So in short, and if you take nothing else from this morning, I'm arguing, I'm trying to put to you that psychosocial studies framework actually enables us to get at the complex web that we all inhabit. If you like, it enables us to get at the pushes and pulls within us, yeah? The, you know, the bit of us that wants to do our best, you know, for ourselves and for other human beings, and actually the bit of us that really would rather just kind of lie in bed all day or go for a walk on what is actually a rather beautiful sunny day. So it's about the conflict within and outside of us. Now, I've already touched on time. God, it's flying by, isn't it? But anyway, literally flying by. But I want to go back and draw out a bit more, actually, the question of time itself. So, alongside, actually, if you like, the complexity of belonging, and as, as I mentioned earlier on, there is the question of the complexity of time. Within cultural theory at the moment, or actually it's been around for a decade or so, time is represented and thought about as an interwoven web. In other words, there is not a clear distinction between the past, the present, and the future, right? So that sort of started off, actually I tried to start off my talk in terms of introducing you to that idea. So within cultural theory, time is absolutely an interwoven web, right? So we can never just think about the past without in a way thinking about our present. We cannot think about our future, what am I going to do next, without thinking about the present situation we're in. So what, what year are you all in, in your degree? Second, third year? Second year. So I'm sure you're all kind of beginning to think through, maybe with some anxiety, about what you're going to do after you finish. Yeah, I'm sure most of you are beginning to think that through. And if you're not thinking it through, my hunch is that your parents and your family are beginning like, well, what are you going to do? And why are you doing a degree like that? Is it of any use to you? Yeah, what, you see, I told you you should have, you know, become a vet. Or I always wish I'd become a dentist. My God, they earn a lot of money. But anyway, let's put that to one. <laughs> that's one. They really do. My dentist earns a bloody fortune from me, actually. <laughs> but anyway, the point is, is, is that you cannot... So in a way, yeah, so there's pressure on you to think about your future, right? And, you know, and I'm sure that pressure is internalized. You feel it within you as well, yeah? Because you all want good lives. And whether we like it or not, under neo-capitalism, good lives means actually earning money. So what I'm trying to point out here is as much as that you're in the present, right, there's a bit of you that's also looking forward to the future, which is based precisely on what you're doing now, and you may also be looking back thinking, well, when I was at school, I hated maths or whatever, and so I'm not going to go into accounting, yeah? Do you see what I mean? Oh, you know, so these things are always interwoven. You cannot be in the present without both being in the past and the future. So this is absolutely at odds with the cognitive science sciences. Cognitive sciences have much more kind of, you know, they have an account of human beings as rational, as the past is the past, the present is the present, and so on and so forth. And what I'm trying to build up here is that actually our sense of who we are, our sense of belonging, is much more marked by these interwoven webs of time, of other human beings, and of how we think about who we are ourselves. 
So all of this is about how actually, in a way, identity itself, belonging itself, is always multi-layered. It's never just one thing. We may freeze our analysis on one thing, because, you know, despite me banging on about sheddedness and jaggedness of being, you know, at some level for you to get a good mark in an essay, yeah, you have to present a coherent essay with the classic phrase of academics, which goes, you need to pay attention to your structure, right? So with that, in, right, do you see it? I mean, I certainly need to pay attention to my structure. I always have done, but anyway, let's bypass that bit. So the point is, is as much as we live in the sheddedness of lived experience, you know, we are multi-layered human beings. We're multi-layered in terms of our identity, in terms of our relationship to belonging and so on. We still, in our analysis, always have to freeze at one point. When you're making a decision about your future, there is a level at which you're going to have to think about the future. You can't just kind of keep thinking, having cozy little memories of your time at school. I'm assuming they were nice. So the past and the present and the future is always a layering. And if you, and if you start in one place, you then kick off. You, you find yourself very quickly into another place itself. Now, partly, actually, of course, so to stick on the question of narration, partly how we narrate our identity, how we re narrate our place in the world is through the stories that we have internalized through others. So, now first of all, we get our narration of ourselves through the family. Now, it's partly they tell us, the family crucially tells us the do's and the do nots of the social order. So, right, and they kind of adapt that as you're growing up. We're much more tolerant of a child under five who grabs the toys of another, right, and is kind of much more in a kind of me, me, me world, we get less tolerant, actually, even from the age of six and certainly upwards, right? So one of the do's of the social orders is that we have to think about other people. And that's one of the things that children from really quite a young age are, if you like, trained into, kind of narrated into, right? Alongside that, all of us inhabit family stories in which you're encouraged to be like, you know, some aunt or other, and at the same time, you know, you're also told, either through silence, hefty silences, or verbal talk, actually, who you should not become like, right? So I had an aunt who was a huge gambler. She lost a lot of money, actually. She didn't make an awful lot. She lost an awful lot of money. I knew from a very early age that I had better not become like this aunt, right? Do you, do you see what I'm trying to say here? Now, my mother never said to me, don't you become like, you know, your auntie X, yeah? But I knew, I knew through the tone of voice, through gestures, through muttered conversations in the kitchen as the family had to run around and pay this aunt's rent yet again, right? So you know, right? So one of the things is that we gain our sense of being, our sense of identity. This is very important, not just through what is said, but also through what is made absent. So, you know, so I knew I wasn't to become like Auntie X. I actually loved her. I thought she was fabulous. She was so glamorous, you see. So there's also the appeal, isn't there? You know, one day I'll become glamorous like that. I've never managed it. My mother's voice is too strong in my head, right? So, but you know, right, actually, I'm quite serious when I say this, actually through what is not said. Yeah, so Auntie Y or Uncle Blah is kind of, you know, held up as a hero, somebody to emulate, and the others are kind of pushed to one side. In other words, we internalize, we inherit these complex stories and they become a part of the narration of our very selves. Now, these stories, of course, you know, about who you should belong to, who you should be like, 
who you should not belong to, who you should not be like, actually we internalize them. They absolutely and utterly become part of our sense of self. So in other words, actually this is another way of saying to you, trying to introduce you to how we become who we are, how we gain our sense of place in the world, actually is continually through other people. So we're all in the grip, actually, we're all in the grip of those family stories, those family narratives, and actually they can be difficult to, to bypass. Uh, we may have a relationship to them, we may, be, we may be able to negotiate them, but they're always somehow in our heads. If you like, another better way of putting this, of course, is actually um, they haunt us. That's the word I want. You know, these, and, and, and so, you know, yeah, they haunt. I'm, I'm really sorry. I can't think of a better word. I can't think of another word because actually haunt actually is the word that is most apposite in terms of trying to uh, describe what it is uh, that I'm trying to get at. So we belong through other people, we gain our narratives through other people, but these narratives are also socio and political. So, right, so in a way, Actually, the socio-political, this is the so social bit of the psychosocial, actually foreclose other narratives, other ways of being. So can I give you an example of that in terms of Egypt right now? Okay, so I'm sorry to shift geopolitical location, but there we go. So in Egypt, oh, a very, 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 I promise not to bore you to death, well, I'll try not to, you know, in 1952, there was a very important revolution in Egypt. And uh, Egypt was, the king was thrown out, King Farouk was thrown out, the British government was thrown out, um, and the very corrupt government of the time was thrown out. Now, from about 1954 up until about 2012, you could barely mention the name of King Farouk. And if you did, it was absolutely, you would get back a political response which was full of kind of contempt, disappointment, denigration, and so on and so forth. Something rather interesting has happened since 2011. And by the way, I just need to say to you, I don't understand it. King Farouk has been absolutely um, I don't know what the word is. Reinstated. Reinstated. Thank you. That, that, that'll just, it, it, if I find a better word, I'll say it in a moment. But he's been kind of, so there was a very popular TV series which was uh, called uh, Malak Farouk, which means King Farouk. Uh, his time is now much more seen as a kind of golden time where people were better off. Alongside that, who's also been resuscitated, uh, much more securely is also NASA under Sadat and Mubarak. So NASA was our president, then we had Sadat, then we had Mubarak, and then we had the 2011 revolution, and now we've got Sisi. So what we've got now is much more banners up with pictures of Gamal Abdel Nasser and Fatah al-Sisi on the same banner. And I'm just going to go for it. Sisi absolutely plays on the linking, the forging of him being just like NASA. So all of this is a socio-political narrative, a socio-political narrative which is absolutely and utterly based on who will rescue Egypt and who will rescue Egypt out of, if you like, a state of colonialism into a golden future. We can, that, that is, if, if you can bear to listen to me again, you can hear me on Wednesday night speak about that endlessly. But in a way, these narratives or discourses, socio-political discourses, are, they shift. 
they change, and they change according to the socio-political situation that we inhabit. So belonging is also always about not belonging. So my hotel room happened to absolutely overlook the demonstration. I'm assuming it was, was it a demonstration of support of your current prime minister, right? And I happened to be in my hotel. Were, were any of you there? <laughs> any of you there? I took photos. <laughs> I'll find you. <laughs> right? But do, do you all know what I'm talking about? You all know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Do all of you know what I'm talking about? Please? Yeah? Okay. All right. So, you know, so the excitement was kind of, you know, generated. It was palpable. It was absolutely palpable. You know, it, it, I could feel it. You know, and then your prime minister came on, I think, to declare that you're going to have an election. Yeah, he's been taking lessons from our prime minister in Britain about calling snap elections, right? You know, and he was kind of, and the, the crowd was absolutely in a state of complete excitement. And, but I was left with the question, what do I know about Maltese politics? Nothing. But I was left with a question about who was not there. Right, you know, who were the people who, so in, in the crowd, I imagine, you know, from the kind of clapping and chanting, the absolutely, <coughs> absolute singing along to, oh God, what's the song? I should have noted it. This is the best day of your life, yeah? That, that song started the rally and ended the rally, okay, right? But the excitement, I can't tell, well, you know, you know, I'm a foreigner, I'm a stranger, so I can say these things, but I couldn't believe the excitement going along with this is the best day of your life. But what I'm trying to say here, it is, right, what I'm trying to say here actually is what happens to those who don't feel it's the best day of their life? What happens to those who actually were not there in support of your current prime minister. He's a prime minister, not a president, isn't he? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, do you see what I mean? And by the way, this is not, I don't want to just pick on Malt, it just so happened, it was so vivid for me because it was there last night. But actually, I'm, I, I also had that thought, by the way, as I witnessed the demonstrations in Midan Tahrir, in, in Cairo and in other squares in, in, in Egypt, right? What happens to those who feel they don't belong to that socio-political discourse, either because they're further to the right, yeah, actually was the case in Egypt itself, or indeed further to the left, yeah, or indeed have a more secular vision, this wouldn't apply to Malta, I don't think, or, or well, I don't know, I don't know about how Catholicism haunts uh, Maltese society in terms of uh, political discourses. So in other words, Actually, what I'm trying to draw out is we can wax lyrical about belonging. You know, I can perhaps over-romanticize the necessity of belonging, but there's always that question about not belonging. So alongside who do I belong to, you know, who do I want to belong to, where do I want to belong, there are always those questions about where do I feel out of place, right? Who with whom do I feel actually that I don't want to belong to them? Yeah, I don't want to belong to the Ahwan, to the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. I'm Egyptian, right? As you can see, I don't wear the hijab, in case you hadn't noticed, right? Mm. Uh, you know, so, and actually, this is a complicated story about my relationship to the Ahwan, to the Muslim Brotherhood, but actually, that's not an organization that I agree with, yeah? So I can be clear about that, but that still then leaves other questions about with whom that actually I want to be in place with. So there are two memoirs, um, both written by men, my apologies for that, but both Stuart Hall, actually in his memoir, which has just come out called Familiar Stranger, which I would really, really recommend, actually. 
And the other memoir is by Edward Said called Out of Place, about which I'm much more ambivalent. You can ask me about that if you want. But both of them speak about feeling that they didn't quite belong to their families. So they're both in different ways appreciative of what their families have given them, but also both of them speak about being out of place. But the issue is if we feel out of place, there's then a fantasy of what it means to be in place. You cannot, alongside what I was trying to say about time, you can't think about the past without thinking about the future in every which way, you cannot think about belonging and being in place without having a notion of what being out of place means. And indeed, the other way around. That might work much more powerfully, that actually when we feel we're out of place, there's then a fantasy and a narrative at work about what it would mean to belong. But in any case, we can only join a group or we can only be a member of a group also actually by not belonging to another group. So to belong actually always means, if you like, an adhesive identification. But it also necessitates ignoring differences in a group say the dif differences amongst us women, or class divisions, or racialized differences. And actually frequently in the attempt to make belonging coherent, belonging matters. Let's not be flippant about this, belonging matters. But in the attempt to belong, we then actually bypass disagreements, absences, regrets, loss. Now that's both within the group and also within that group's relationship to the other group. So frequently, to belong, and I think this is especially the case, actually, politically, then we must repress our doubts, our ambivalences, our worrying thoughts. So frequently, this is in the UK, you're going to have to fill me in about Malta, Actually, there are strong socio-political discourses about belonging and nationhood and the migrant and the foreigner. So one of the main reasons why people voted out, voted to leave the European Union, was because of the fear of the migrant. And, and, and for reasons I really, really cannot grasp, I'm sorry about this, I cannot grasp it, the group that got the most um, anti-migrant feelings were the Polish communities. Now, it's partly, actually, they have a reputation for working very hard. They also have a reputation. I have no idea if any of this is true or not, but it's part of the political rhetoric, is that they also undercut English workers, so they require less money and so on and so forth. But the point is, is that for people to feel that they had a place actually involved, actually an absolute rejection of the other. I could talk with you about Islamophobia, but it doesn't feel kind of quite right at the moment. So belonging, belonging and identity is never personal. It starts off, if you like, as personal, but none of us, none of us have as much uh, choice or autonomy in our sense of our identity or indeed our sense of belonging. Now, it's after 10.2, so uh, um, I was going to talk a bit more about place. Do you want me... Should we stop and have a bit of a conversation and then go on to talk about place or or or, or what? How do you want to, tell me I'm at your service. What would you like to do? Kind of mull this over a bit and then talk about place? What are your thoughts? What's in your heads at this moment in time besides God when will she finish and I can go and get a cup of coffee? What are your thoughts? Because you know, belonging, as I'm trying to say, is something that matters to all of us. Any thoughts? Questions? 
You mean this so made so much sense? You agreed with every word I said. You can disagree with me. I'm not going to die. <laughs> what does it mean to you to be Maltese? What does it mean? In my opinion, I think we're talking Maltese even to learn, to communicate with our lecturers, you know. I think we can be formed in Maltese, not just by using English. Okay, all right. And do you feel differently than, so I'm assuming you speak Maltese at home? Yes. Yes. And, and does that feel different to say, well, that you're speaking to me now? Yes. Yeah? What's the, so what's the difference for you? I don't know, I think I'm more comfortable using Maltese because growing up, yeah. I've always spoken in Maltese, yes. even at school. Yes. I mean, they encouraged us to use English, but... We were allowed to use Maltese to talk to our teacher, so... Yeah, I see. So you come in and out, right? So, okay. All right, well, I thought it was interesting what you were saying about what's formal and what isn't so formal. So it doesn't map across so easily, does it? What about other people's thoughts and experiences? What does it feel like to inhabit an island? I believe we take this idea for granted a bit that yeah. once you were born in a country, mm. sort of because of your parents and your grandparents lived there, mm. you sort of are going to feel a sense of welcome in that place as well. So we take the idea for granted that if my mm. parents are Maltese and my grandparents are Maltese, so mm. I'm going to be Maltese, I'm going to be accepted in this country, mm. no matter what, what I believe or what I say. Mm. If someone else before me managed, I think I'll manage as well. So. The idea of, of being Maltese, uh, but in the same way speaking English as well, alongside of our Maltese language, um, I believe that since, uh, as, as Bernice also said, since we use Maltese language nearly for the majority of, of, of the minutes of, of, our, of our day, um, you sort of expect that if we're speaking between two Maltese people, for example, we're going to use Maltese, we're going to use English. If, for example, I'm speaking with a friend, with a lecturer, or, or with the bus driver, with the person who sweeps the seats, for example, I have no idea in my mind if I'm going to speak to him in English. I think I instantly I will go for the Maltese language. Mm. So, sort of, I, I think that we belong more closer to, to, to the Maltese language and using it rather than, yeah. or than using the English language in, mm. in a context where we can use both. Yeah. We can use both because mm. a friend can also speak in English or a mm. colleague can also speak in English, but I think we tend to go immediately for, for, for the Maltese language. Mm. I wanted to, I think you said two very important things. So one of the things I think you said that was very important is we take our belonging for granted. Right? That was actually your, your, you used for granted. That was your words. And I think we have to because if any of us got up in the morning and started really questioning our belonging, right, we would go quite insane. And actually, I'm not being flippant about that. So there's always this double thing, isn't there, where you have to take something for granted and call it into question at the same time. Yeah? So it's that double thing. But what I am trying to say is that we need to think through the question of belonging and where it can perhaps hinder us from making a slightly different future. The other thing I want to pull out from what you said, which I thought was rather touching, actually, when you said, um, well, you know, you talk about your parents and your grandparents, and you said... Well, if they can manage, so can I, right? So I think also that notion of belonging or we belong and we gain sustenance, we gain support from it. One of the things actually about family narratives actually sometimes is that they do include, oh, you know, actually I can remember my mum talking about a time when we were really, really poor and her walking down the market, right? And then she kind of found a solution so actually, we also find sustenance and support, nurture from family narratives, 
even if they're not explicitly said to us. So I think the question of belonging, the belonging of other, other people in the past, helps us in the present. Thank you. What are other people's thoughts? Is that a cow outside or is that a mine? No, what is that bell? All oh, right. Oh. Okay, so what are other people's thoughts? I think it's also interesting, actually, that um, what I was struck by uh, also is you all know one another. So you can't talk, take a walk with Adrian. Don't ever try and take a walk, because every five seconds you think you're in the middle of a sentence, you know, and he's stopping and shaking somebody's hand, right? You all know what, sorry. We all know, I'm not actually, but never mind. Uh, we, we all know what, you all know one another. I think that's also the effect. Now, that might also be a point of support. Sometimes you may just want to be able to walk through the street and no one know you. Yeah, do you know what I mean? So it's both the support and there may be a flip side to that as well. So where do you feel, actually? So where do you feel, actually, about belonging if you had to, for one reason or another, leave Malta? What would you miss about it? What would you miss about Malta? What is it you might long for when you're abroad? One of the things that migrants always speak about, Stuart Hall talks about this early on in his memoir, is food. Yeah? Yeah, there's that, you know, I had this soup last night. I can't, I don't have an, any idea if it was good by Maltese standards or not. I'm quite serious when I say that. Do you know, for me, it was a bit odd, but I have no idea. Yeah, and I was sitting there thinking, is this good Maltese soup? Or not, right? I don't have a, I don't have a, a, a place to judge by it. But one of the things people often speak about, one of the senses, after all, is taste. I had a friend who was Australian. He grew up, his parents' house was on the beach. It took him years and years and years and years when he came to the UK. He never properly slept because he didn't have the sound of the sea. Yeah? So those things, yeah, those things that actually he would never think about, oh, I get to sleep by, by the sound of the sea. But when it's taken away, that which is taken for granted comes into sharp relief. Yeah. So what do you think you might miss about Malta? You might miss the weather, especially if you're in England. The language. The language. When I'm abroad, when I form my parents, I feel that I can speak Maltese, I feel at home. Yeah. Because when I'm abroad, I have to... I don't appreciate the fact that in Malta I speak both languages. And when you go abroad, I have to speak just English. Mm. So then I miss Maltese. Yeah. In a way, that's even not hearing people yes. speaking my language. I feel an outsider. Yeah. Away from home. Out of place. Out of place. I think even the idea that nowadays when you go to eat at a restaurant, most of the waiters are foreign. So we have to speak in English. And yeah. I think the idea that you have to speak English by force. For example, my grandparents won't go out to eat because they don't know how to talk in English. So even, ah, so even like, here? Yes, even in Malta. Oh, that's fascinating. So like uh, among us, we say, we're in Malta. Why do I have to speak English just to order food? But so you can't just order a cup of coffee in Maltese? No, most, uh, in my experience, most, most waiters are foreign. So you have to speak in English, and they very you know English because they're still there in English. So, wow. Oh, well, that's really, that's very interesting, isn't it, then? So the question of language becomes critical here, and it then becomes critical in terms of even Maltese's experience of where they can and cannot go, where they feel comfortable and where they don't feel comfortable. Wow. It's also a generational thing about... Oh, oh I, I'm making a UK assumption here. I was thinking also, like my grandfather, you know, he never went out to eat. It just wasn't part of actually what happened. While actually my generation, you know, we go out to eat at the drop of a hat at some level. It's kind of... It's, it's a bit odd, but yeah, so it's also different, different ways of being. What else? What are, do you have any other thoughts about belonging, indeed about identity? 
itself. Uh, sometimes I wonder uh, how, to, to what extent the older generation feels alienated in their own country here. Mm. Because since, mm. since, ever since we've been part of the EU, mm. we've been so cosmopolitan and so many people have been coming over and Maltese people and, and foreign people uh, building relationships together. But then there's the older generation who miss the simple life and the intimacy between friends and families. And like, like Bernice said, it's a bit hard nowadays for the older generation, for, for a group of old friends, for example, to go order a cup of tea at a restaurant because the waiters are, most of them are foreign, foreigners and uh, lots of uh, different complicated items on the menus and mm -hmm. everything makes mm -hmm. it, the country mm -hmm. became a bit more complicated over yeah. the years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And obviously it's, it's um, expected since now we're part of a much larger sphere. But I think that the idea of, of being a small country and and belonging together and neighbors knowing each other and, and being so close even with your relatives because everyone lives so close to each other, I think that's something that the older generation misses mm -hmm. and something that I would personally miss if I had to move into a larger country. It's something that's not very easy to find. Mm. Well, that's very interesting, actually, because I think what you're talking about is the impact of globalization and migration on lived everyday experience. So I suspect for some people, it may be a pleasure. I dread ordering a coffee these days in a cafe because I can't just say, can I have a coffee? Because I've got to go through, you know, do I want a skinny latte with a no, 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 chocolate, no chocolate, espresso, double eggs, no, 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 I think I just want a coffee, you know? And I, but I'm of the older generation, yeah. But for some people, that might be a pleasure, right? But I think so. So I think part of belonging is always also always about loss. Yeah. And I, but I think what you're very poignantly bringing into the room is the loss of an older generation. But it also sounds like you're feeling it a bit because you sort of say, actually, you don't want to go. There's I no reason why you should. But I'm also influenced by my family. Because, for example, As we all are. Last week, it was my grandmother's birthday. Happy and birthday, grandmother. <laughs> and she, she turned 89, so and wow. she's, a, she's a very um, reserved kind of person. Mm. She doesn't really know much about what's going on in the, like, in the EU. She's, mm. a very, she's a very local person. She yeah. lives in, a, in an old village. And we took her to a, a, new, a new cafeteria in, in her village. where it's, it's an old village, but the cafeteria is brand new and all the waiters are foreign. So. She's been living there for 89 years, but she still feels that she doesn't belong anymore to certain places mm. in her village, just because mm. time has made things change so fast. Mm. Mm. And I understand the way she feels as well. Yes, yes, yeah. And I think it's not just her, it's, it's the majority of the older generation in this country. Mm. They feel this way. Mm. I want to pick up um, from your stories, actually, all of you. Bernice, I'm sorry, you're the only person that's been named, so, you know. <laughs> so your name will be stuck with me, at least for the next hour. Don't rely on my memory after that. Okay, I think that whole issue then about the impact of globalization and the impact of where you belong and what happens, the changes that happen or not, that means that people, even though they've lived somewhere for a long time, end up in certain places in that locality feeling out of place. But also, I think what all of you, the three of you, have really drawn out is the question also of feelings. You know, none of us are neutral yeah, to what is, go to what is going on. Uh, do you see what I mean? So we all have feelings, we all have anxieties, disappointments, um, pleasures, or whatever. But I think what I also want to draw out is I think what's also very important in terms of belonging is that we have to be able to identify in two different ways. So we have to be able to identify with people who are like us. I am sorry to pick on your 89-year-old grandmother, but say your grandmother has to be able to identify, as we all do, with people who are like us, 
right, from our family or who have the same kind of socio-political location, and simultaneously, ethically, so that's an ethics embedded in that. We can't just go, they are not like us, right? I think this is where things really collapse, such, and I think this is where we're really lost. And we also have to identify with those who are not like us. So what does it mean for these waiters who have to be able to speak English, but themselves are struggling to learn to speak English? It's kind of quite a double one, isn't it? You know, you speak English well, but then you, you, you know, it all goes a bit apart for you when you feel you have to speak English, yeah? You know, so the, the issue then is how we identify to, in those who are other. Right, so I am saying that this whole question of belonging also rests on a double identification with those who are similar and those who are known, those who are familiar and those who are different, unknown, unfamiliar. I never thought I would say this this morning, but Freud, Freud had an injunction and Freud's injunction went our first duty is to remember the existence of the other, right? That's so. In that case, we all have a duty then to remember our families, yeah, our friends, our loved ones, those who make us up much more securely, securely and those who are outside of, who are strangers, migrants, foreigners. Have I made any kind of sense, yes? It's a, it's, it's a double ethical position, if you like, because, you know, seeing so much sociopolitical, cultural narrative is about implicitly who belongs and who doesn't, then actually uh, that arises from that is the ethics and the emotions and what, and what do they mean. I hope I have made sense in terms of that, yeah? Does anybody have anything else to say? Anything else? Do you want to say so anything? So what can the grandmother and the waiter meet? That's an interesting question. I think they can meet, partly they'd have to meet in the cafeteria. Well, I think they can meet in both of them recognizing that actually at that moment in time, they're both having difficulty. Right? I think that's oddly enough where they can meet. I think where it falls apart is if the waiter imagines your grandmother as secure and in place, and he's the one that's out of place, and if your grandmother, I'm sorry to pick on that example, and if your grandmother is the one who imagines the waiter is in place. So I think that's where they can meet, in a kind of shared recognition that they're both out of place and they're both struggling. Yeah, so it's, I feel like a kind of an ethical position that arises, J Judith Butler, anybody know who I'm talking about in terms of Judith Butler? No, thank God. Right, but Judith... She was here a couple of months ago. Was she? God, she gets she about. Her. Did you understand her? <laughs> Cut that out. Cut that out. <laughs> okay. Judith Butler, who's, who's earlier, God, I shouldn't have said that, never mind. Early, I'm going to leave in a moment. Judith Butler's early work on gender is, shall we say, very complex. Her latest work on ethics is, much, is politically much easier to get a handle on. Now, one of the things that Judith Butler talks about is actually our shared humanness, our shared sociality can only arise from our knowledge that we're all vulnerable, right? So actually we're all vulnerable and we're all precarious. So actually how we then deal with actually our lives has to be from that position of knowing ours and other people's vulnerability. We're all up against, none of you are, you know, but you will be at some point in your lives, you know, you're not up against the aging body. I am, you're not. That's one difference between us, yeah? You know, I'm not being flippant when I say that. You know, we're all up against, and perhaps one of the problems of the migrant figures, of course, that they do absolutely represent 
at some level the precariousness of life. One moment they're in, say, Syria, living a life, and the next moment they have to, in order to keep going a life, have to move somewhere else, right? So it's about vulnerability. Mm-hmm. I was also thinking, you know, Clayton's grandmother, I was thinking... What's his name? Clayton. Thank you. So, Hi. Um, <laughs> I was thinking, if if, uh, if if your mother, if your grandmother can't speak English, she would need uh, a mediator. Yeah. She would need a mediator, so yeah. there's a role for us too. <coughs> yes. For those. Yeah. So it's yeah. Also, I suppose it's not only about our recognizing our vulnerabilities, but it's also somehow our ethical position, no? Yes. As mediators. As mediators, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Did you want to say more? I cut across you. Do you want me to carry on or are you all ready to stop? You, I'm, I mean, I'm really, really at your service. You tell me what it is that you want. I'm not going to do a vote. Can I um, say, say something? Because we're doing, a, we're doing a course on, well, we did the first part of our course about um, historical novels. Ah. So this is from the Romantic period, we're talking late 19th and basically early 20th century. But then we're also doing what we call the, the um, socio-realist uh, novelists, also called reformist novelists, who are writing basically at the same time as the historical novelists. And we're talking 30s, 1930s, 1940s. And one of the novelists who was writing these uh, socio-realist um, novels, who wrote a socio-realist novel. No, this is, is Juan Momo I referred to in my, mm. my emails, um, who was in Egypt in, in between 1913 and 1921. And he writes this extraordinary novel about a group of Baltic migrants who go to New York, who live in Anna Venus um, uh, Grandma Venus children in, in, in America, in New York. And his protagonist, one of he doesn't really have any protagonists, except perhaps the narrating voice. But let's say his favorite character is, is, is a guy called Felich, who is the only one who actually remains in New York and decides to leave the group, even though his sister is, is part of the group. Because the group refuses to adapt to the new situation, it refuses to um, uh, listen and to... to, to to observe what's happening around them. They, they, they want to remain Maltese through and through, mm. even though they're in New York. Mm. So he decides to leave. He only has a bit of education. He can somehow read and write. Um, so he feels that if he sticks to his group, and even to his sister, he's going to be dragged down into, into the depths of their ignorance. Mm. So he leaves the group, he finds a job, and then he turns up again when they're being uh, pestered by this, uh, you know, fasc- uh, this fascist agitator. Um, and then he leaves them again. He leaves them for good. And they come back to Malta, they all die. And it's, it's a, it's a you know, very particular novel. But I was thinking about his sense of belonging and how he very much represents Juan Mamo, Fe- Felice is really um, Mamo's idea of uh, what the Maltese person should do uh, with education, with, with emancipation and all of that. I was thinking about, you know, in the context of what you've been saying about belonging and how this is related, inter- uh, intimately related to group and to not belonging. I was thinking about this, this figure of Felix, this, this, this man who, this young man, who knows that uh, if he's going to belong, continue to belong to this group, He's going to be dragged down with them. Go for it. I think what's very interesting in the Edward Said Stuart Hall memoirs is that they're both colonial subjects. Stuart Hall, for those of you who don't know, was Jamaican. He then, at the age of 19, left Jamaica and went and settled in England. He was a Rhodes Scholar, never finished his PhD. That, I think, is an important part of his story, actually. And, but actually then ends up doing a lot, a lot of cultural theory work on actually black representation, and especially in terms of photographs and arts. 
Now, then, so we've got him, and then we've got Edward Said, who was an Egyptian Palestinian Christian, who also ends up going actually to America to get educated. One of the absolute themes in both their memoirs is, if you like, them, them feeling they don't belong to their families. And they don't belong to their families partly because their families actually want to identify with the colonizer. So in Stuart Hall's case, his family doesn't kind of get into radical black politics because they so want to maintain their sense of a middle class, not even Jamaican family, but a middle class family. So he's then embarrassed actually by their kind of class pretensions, for a better way of putting it. Edward Said, no way, I mean, you know, as a member, his family was exceptionally rich, actually. But so that, that wasn't about class dimensions, but it was about him also politically feeling his family, especially his father, didn't do more to stand up to the British. So there we've got the kind of the political, the political is always personal, the personal is always political, Right, but there we've got them feeling they don't belong because of their family's wish to position them in certain ways. So Edward Said has got a story where um, he tried to enter the sporting club. I, I, I don't think you have these in Malta. They're very big in Egypt. And sporting clubs are clubs where actually every middle class family belongs to and above and it's literally where you can go play football swim you have them here no no they're kind we of like have, a, yeah we used to have under the british mm. yeah and so edward said or oh, he's crossing the grounds and he gets stopped and he's told you're an arab you're an arab you're not a member of this club he tells his father the story. His father says, yes, I'll do something about it. And he doesn't. So at that moment, Edward Said is absolutely infuriated and disappointed in his father's lack of capacity to stand up to the colonizer, right? So there's a lot of, actually, so if we draw out this theme, there's then a lot of actually disappointment and anger in terms of people's relationship to their families, in terms of what is it they, which bits of the family story and narrative do they want to identify and which not. Okay, can I give you, this is a very personal story here. Okay, so I'm going to give you a very personal story. When I was two, so you can all now work out how old I was. When I was two, it was 1956, okay, right? And what happened was the Suez Canal crisis, which I don't expect any, in, any of you in this room to know about. So I'll tell you very briefly. The British colonized Egypt because of the Suez Canal. Following the 1952 revolution, Nasser, uh, 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 there was a, 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 a tripartite aggression and Nasser fought uh, the British, the French, and the Israelis to really gain control over the Suez Canal and to nationalize it. Okay, so that's the kind of broad framework of this. And from that, I'm going to lead into a family story. So I could wow you all and tell you about my father, who was an Egyptian Muslim, and I could give you a story of his anti-imperialism, right? And we could all crack open the champagne and we could all have a very nice little Marxist time celebrating my dad, right? And, you know, so it would be in opposition to Edward Said and Stuart Hall's stories of them feeling out of place, that they didn't belong, because there's a story where I could give you where I belong, and I become the heroine of this family narrative, right? But you know, there's another important figure, because we don't just have dads, we also have mothers, right? So my mother, English, Christian, she's another confrontation altogether because she agreed with the British aggression 
in Suez. You can imagine, my parents' marriage didn't last very long. And actually, one of the reasons I think it didn't last was actually because of the political. So I'm absolutely serious when I say the political is personal, right? So my mother, so I could give you that story, except I'm much more reluctant to give you that story because that story brings us right up against how colonialism has been internalized, how actually colonialism, what's the word I'm looking for, gets perpetuated, and actually about who is identified with. So my mother's story is much more a story about xenophobia and nationalism and not being part of the fight against anti-imperialism and anti-colonialism. Yeah. I hope I made some kind, of, some kind of sense. So this question then about belonging is always a question also about what we want to identify with, right? Who we want to identify with, which political position do we want to take up? Do we want to be the me mediator in terms of Clayton's grandmother, right, between her and the waiter, right? Or do we just think we distance ourselves and think it's their problem, right? How do we understand globalization? I'm sorry to keep using that word. I think it might be a more relevant word now than in terms of Malta. Though there's, a, 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 you know, so actually about neoliberal capital, how is, does that work in terms of people's lived experiences and people's lived lives? Having said all of that, there is still the question of how colonialism haunts. Haunts Malta, it haunts you in the very language that you speak. I, you know, yeah, the very way you say yes and no is Arabic. Yeah. So even if somebody says to you, well, they could never say that to your granny, but you know, how do you want your coffee in English? And she responds, right? And she says yes or no. Absolutely, she's got Arabic shot through there. I don't know what you do with the French in terms of Malta. Nothing, Italy? In, in what sense? Well, in terms of your history. Uh, with well, the French, it was, it was a very short. So it was very short. And it had no impact? Really? Not too much, I'd say. Because it was basically a three months Oh, three months. Oh, right. The rest of it was uh, the French besieged and the harbor area where you stayed. All right, okay, all right, okay. But, but with the British, of course, it's big. Yeah, yes. And with the Italians, it's a very long history of, of culture, political, political and economic, uh, very strong uh, contacts. Uninterrupted. Oh, that's interesting. So you've got to begin to get your hearts and minds and souls around these questions, really. And I think begin to think them through in terms of how you do your cultural analysis, because they're there, they're taken for granted. I really can't, I don't know your name. I'm beginning to pick up something else. Thank you. Thank you. I'll never get that. So, <laughs> <laughs> forgive me. Tyron. Tyron. Oh, Tyron, thank you. Thank you. So as Tyron was saying, is that which can be taken for granted and that which needs to be prized apart. And that is your task, even if after you graduate, you will go away and sensibly become dentists and earn loads of money. You still got to learn how to take it for granted and how to step back. And as I was trying to say, there are ethical requirements of all of us as human beings in terms of how we respond to that which is known and that which is not known. So I think on that note we'll stop. Unless you have any comments or questions or disagreements. Anything? Anything? No? Help your gran. <laughs> I'm sure, actually I have no doubt about that. Okay, thank you all for being here.